Hello everyone and welcome to the 130 breakout session of the Open Simulator Community Conference 2013. As a reminder to our in-world and web audiences, you can view the full conference schedule on our website at conference.opensimulator.org and you can post your questions in local chat on the Ustream chat or tweet your comments using the hashtag OSCC13. This hour, we are happy to introduce Gahilde Meisel Egghart, who will be presenting Language Quest and Data Analytics in Secondary School. Gahilde Meisel Egghart is a freelancer in the field of educational technology and co-founder of Talkademy.org, a not-for-profit organization that engages in using and creating virtual environments, virtual environments, and learning for learning purposes. Talkademy.org serves universities, companies, and individuals with learning events using Second Life and OpenSim and is a frequent partner in European projects, Avalon, Talk With Me, Nextel, Euroversity, e Inspiration. Before starting Talkademy.org, Gerhilde received a degree in computer science from the Technical Univer University of Vienna and gathered about 10 years of professional experience in software engineering, project management, quality management, and training. Welcome, Gerhilde. Gerhilde. Well, thank you very much, Joe, uh, for this long introduction. I hope everybody can hear me well. Um, well, welcome uh, to my talk. Hello, everybody. I hope that uh, everybody found me because this is rather something belonging to the educational track and not that much here. But yes, as I said, Hopefully you'll find me. This, this conference is so well organized, so it should be possible. What I basically want to do tonight is to give you a short report about some interesting aspects of school projects that we had run as a part of uh, the Nextel project during the last couple of years. And as far as I, I know, there's very little going on, at least in Europe, in secondary schools. And this is really a pity because everybody who tries to bring this kind of technology to schools sees how much students love it, how they get engaged, how much they can learn with this kind of technology. But as well, everybody who has already worked with schools, and I know some of you had, knows why there is so little going on in schools, because schools are really a different partner to work with. They are running on their own track somehow. So one interesting question is how can we approach them? Which, what kind of activities can we offer them to get their attention and to fit it, to make it fit it into their normal schedule? And I think one very nice activity that is actually interesting for schools are language quests. And this will be pretty much the, the longer part of my talk. What I want to share with you is some experience about language quests that we developed and give you some examples, two examples. And of course, you are more than welcome to reuse this kind of uh, quests in your own classrooms or for your own research and um, help us develop it with, with us. Um, there are some European projects going on that try to engage teachers. Nick Zwart has already introduced the TILA project to you, I guess. Um, and there was this avatar project before, which also tried to engage teachers. And uh, we from Academy, as part of the next step project, we did quite a lot of uh, workshops for teachers in Austria, but the response, well, the interest is there, but actually making the step into the classroom is a much tougher way. So hopefully uh, what I tell you today will hope a little bit to, to get this technology one step further into the classroom. Basically, there are three aspects in my talk, as I said before. Um, there is this quest design topic, including two examples. There is the aspect of, of data analytics, which is pretty much the field of research of the Nextel project. 
we know that in virtual worlds we can actually collect a lot of data. We can track everything our students are doing. We know what they do, where they click, where they go, whom, who they chat with, what they chat. So there's a lot of data to collect. And the interesting question, of course, is what to do with this, this data and what's what does this data tell us? How can we use this data to come to conclusions about students' skills and learning progresses? And finally, the third aspect of my talk is working with schools. As I said before, there are quite some challenges in working with schools. But the good news is that there are also some ways how, well, how we can handle it. And, well, our special thanks goes to 3D LES and Nick Zwart, who allowed us to use his beautiful village of Chatterdale for the school trials. And, of course, to the European Commission to, for, for the support, for the funding, this kind of research via the Nextel project and the university network. Um, I want to give you a quick overview of the Nextel project, just, just the basic ideas, because this explains why we were invited into this project. Uh, the Nextel project basically is about tracking what students are doing online, um, which kind of learning activities, um, analyzing what they're doing, visualizing what they're doing, and feeding it back to the teacher to give the teacher a tool for planning further activities. And uh, the next step project has quite a broad approach in terms of technology. So they are not, foc not only focused on virtual worlds, but all kinds of, of learning applications like, uh, like Moodle or or, of course, mobile applications and, and Web 2.0 and whatever. But the important part always is to be able to collect this data. And there, of course, virtual worlds fit in perfectly. And this is our part in here. Um, as I told before, Quest Design is something I want to focus here because this is really something that makes a difference to the students and, of course, to the teachers when you try to convince the teacher that this kind of activity is beneficial for the student. Um, the first question when, when um, designing a quest, of course, is, is the topic, the kind of stories that are appealing to the target group. And when we started this, the target group are, were 13-year-old kids. So the first idea was something to do with some mysteries, some vampire stories, adventure stories, something with crime, whatever. But then finally, one idea came from the students themselves, because when they first entered Chatterdale, they asked, where are all the people? Because when when being in a city, normally you expect that there are other people there. And as we all know, unless we invite people into our virtual spaces, normal, they are quite, quite empty. And this gave a nice starting point for, for this quest to let them explore what happened to the population of Chatterdale. Um, some more details about this later. Then, of course, the, the second question is, how can we achieve a maximum of activity? How can we really make the kids work? How can we ensure that there's enough interaction with each other and with the environment? Something I forgot to tell at the beginning was that uh, this school trial was a cooperative project between a school in Austria and in Norway. And of course, this is a, a very interesting setup for the kids because they're, they have to, to use English as their common language. So 
One point is to ensure that there's interaction going on be between the Austrian and the Norwegian kids, and of course, between them and the environment. And there are several ideas how this maximum of activity can be achieved. One is certainly to foster asymmetric roles within a team. So, for example, kids would have different parts of information and need to combine it. Or not all of the kids have the same task to do, so they have slightly different assignments. Um, then, of course, there's the possibility to interact with the environment, to read hints, etc., but as well to interact with, with uh, actors, which we have to, to organize some, somehow. Uh, preferably native speakers of the language they should learn. And then, of course, there's the possibility for interaction with the greater community, that they look for information somewhere in the internet, in textbooks. So a combination with web quests would be possible. Um, I'll show you later when I talk about the examples, how we, or which strategy we used for our examples. The third point is the question of immersion. And we think that immersion is really a very important topic because this makes the difference whether students just feel themselves being spectators or being right in there. And here we took some inspiration from uh, live role plays, which we well, I have already tried out at the birthday parties of my own kids and they always worked very well. For example, once we had a party with the topic, become a private investigator. And while the kids were doing some training sessions like, like, um, like uh, analyzing fingerprints, for example, a neighbor rang the door and told that some valuable children was stolen. And now suddenly, the theory met practice, and the kids were right there on the first job. And this is how we try to drag the kids into this story. And we, we use this as inspiration for this virtual quest as well. So we tr <laughs> there as well, we try to drag the kids in. And I'll explain later how we did this. Um, of course, one important issue is the potential chaos, how to minimize that, because having 20 kids in the same room with headsets and voice going on and everything um, has a huge potential of chaos. And one possibility how to address this is certainly to, to, team, to build teams, somehow to make sure that each student know exactly where his team is that uh, we use names or groups so they know where their own team is and of course they know very well what their exactly task is and this is something a teacher has to ensure um, before there are well <laughs> this is one slide where i talk a lot but uh, no no more you should see the the slide quest design can you see it? The slide one quest design. I think you might need to reset the display. Okay. How do I reset the display? How do you do that? Maybe click the home button. There should be a, I think a red X at the bottom of it. Okay. So you don't, you, you well, still see my, my very first slide. Now, 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 wait a minute, hit the home button first. Try that. Okay. The home button now. Okay, go to the beginning. I believe that got it now. Okay, so now you see my first slide. Now it's the first. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, I think you'll need to do that then and try to find the catch up with the slides and you should be okay, maybe. Okay, so you did you see this one? <laughs> okay, doesn't matter. Not that important. You see this one?
Uh -huh. So this is the one I was just talking about. Okay. So the potential chaos. This is a big issue, something uh, we could talk hours and hours and hours. And finally, of course, the organizational context is a very important important part of each quest design. We we need to know before how this this whole quest fits into into the lesson, into the session, into the curriculum. Um, if it's something that runs over several days, weeks, or the whole school year, we once had the idea to support a whole year of A1 English learning with activities in Chatterdale which would make one long story in many chapters. But this is still just an idea, so maybe somebody wants to help us with this. Um, and this brings me already to the first example. <laughs> the first example, and I have a quick, a short video here, and I was told that I should just paste the link to local chat so you can watch it in your private browsers and wouldn't have to watch it here. So I'll, I hope that you can all open this link and watch the video and then I'll go on talking in two minutes. Does this work? Oh, really? They don't work? No. We apologize for the delay here. We're trying to uh, see if we can get the slide system working again for our viewing audience. Just hang in there for a few minutes or a few seconds, I hope. Or Hilda, is somebody there helping you? Here comes Nebanon to the rescue. So I hope you've all seen this wonderful video, which Nick compiled. Try to keep it slower. Oh, okay. So shall I try to? Okay. Then I guess I sit down again and put my slides there again. Yes. 
Um, should I delete them before? Okay, let's delete them. <laughs> yes, I think this video <clears throat> is really great. We have shown it so many times and people always love it. So, now I have dragged my slides again over there. Can you see them now? Does it work now? Can you Stand up again. Can try one more. Okay. All right, good, Hilda. I think we've got a problem with our slides, so maybe we should continue the session with. Can you do it without? Them? Okay, without slides. Well, they are not that great anyway. So, well, hmm, but maybe the next one would be interesting. Um, can you send me them, please? Not well. If the prompts are wrong, send me the textures. Okay. And uh, button. Um, how can I send them to you? Um, Nebadon, how can I send the slides to you? Can I just drag them into chat? No, I can't. I think the properties are fine. Drag them on me. Okay. Where are you? Then I stand up first. Oh, here you are. Okay. Oops. <laughs> now they're completely gone. No. Okay. Hmm. I think there is some some uh, some permission issue because I cannot give them to you. Ah, no, no, I can't give them to you. I'm sorry. Most strange. Did you receive it now? Okay. Can't I give you? All of them at the same time. I let them all now. We got one. I think I can only give you one at a time. Try to make it in one. Okay. okay. Well, I'll just go on. Hmm? I just go on and you tell me if you think <laughs> you can. Okay, that'll work. Shall I turn the page? Wait, it's working. Oh, thanks, Alfonso, for the feedback. But the permissions was the permission problem. Next to okay.
This is where it almost stops. First one. Hey. Stopped again. Yeah, okay, I'll just go on if there were no problem. So, which is the right one? We can zoom in on that desk, okay. So, now you have seen this wonderful video about the Chat Little Mystery, and I'll tell you just quickly what this story is about and then you can you can judge on your own if you think this would be interesting for a 30 year old kid or not mm. the story basically is that some thousand years ago aliens have distributed energy dispensers all over the universe and one of those is the place that's today known as Chetterdale and they chose the place because of the near cave because their skin is very sensitive to uh, ultraviolet radiation. And when they ran out of energy, they came to Chatterdale and were quite surprised to see how the area had changed. And then those strange people were playing football with this energy dispenser. And however, the aliens were fascinated by this huge variety of things that those people have had there. And they started collecting them during the night and collected those things to their cave. And then the aliens council decided that the strange creatures had dishonored the, the holy site and therefore should be teleported away. And first, um, they, they um, isolated Chatterdale from the rest of the world. They cut internet connections, closed the railway tunnels, etc. And then they used the teleporter. But the, there was a programmer mistake with the set coordinate. So only those humans who were on the surface of Chatterdale were teleported away. Not the priest who was in the catacombs and not the barkeeper who was looking for more beer in the cellar. And Professor Jones, who had already been close on the aliens' heels for years, had been in the cellar together with the barkeeper. And this Professor Jones had found out most of the story and had written letters to his aunt. But they never left Chatterdale, those letters, so the students can find them. And finally, Professor Jones managed to find the cave that was trapped there. And so he had to wait for his rescue. And this whole story is manifested in Chatterdale by various hints. For example, police records that the students can find in the police station about thefts. Because, as I said before, the aliens had started to collect some objects that they found there. And, of course, people said this is, well, they were stolen. Um, then they have the statements of the survivors, of the barkeep and the priest. They have letters uh, to Professor Jones' aunt, which never left Chatterdale, which they found at the post office. And, of course, they have as a starting point um, some statements, for example, statements from, uh, from, from Amazon.com who realized that the Chatterdale people do not pay the bills anymore. And, um, well, this is quite an, a, a challenging mystery. And some interference skills are needed are needed by the students, so it's not that easy. But as they are in teams, we thought <laughs> they should be able to solve it. Um, what we need as a preparation, of course, is we need to set up these hints in Chatterday. I hope that you can see this this slide here. Um, at the right side, for example, okay, you see a customer complaint record at uh, the, the local computer store where several people had complained that the internet doesn't work anymore. Um, 
And the other thing is a is a letter which uh, which Professor Jones wanted to write to his to his aunt, and there he tells that he he caught a radiogram and he observed some strangers in the night, things like this. And now, how do we how do we run this story with the students? The basic idea is that there is a teacher in the class who reads a story to the students and shows those slides where several people wonder what's going on in Chatterdale. For example, as I said before, uh, the Chatterdalers do not pay the bills anymore. Or the train from Chatterdale does not arrive anymore. Or uh, Professor Jones' aunt who said, well, he had promised to send a letter every week, but no letter came. And then finally, of course, uh, people, uh, people from the from from the newspaper, they just think, what's going on in Chatterdale? We have to send some people there and uh, and find it out. So first we read this story, then we dis distribute fictitious emails to each team. For example, this is an email from a private investigation company who was uh, contacted by this aunt of Professor Jones. And he writes to, to his team of private investigators that they have received uh, uh, this order from, from the aunt that they should go to Chatterday, look for Professor Jones, go there immediately, meet your team members at the police station and check what the police knows about Professor Jones. And then they should send a report and an invoice and uh, by, by the end of the day. So each of the team, each team, we have uh, five different teams, and each team gets this fictitious email. And this is the point where they log into Chatterdale, go there, meet their colleagues from Norway, if they're Austrians, or from Austria, if they're Norway, Norwegian, and go explore Chatterdale, hopefully find the letters, hopefully find the other hints, hopefully find the surviving a bit drunk bartender, yes, and hopefully find Professor Jones in the cave at the end. And uh, in order to get into the cave, they have to, to find out the secret key that opens uh, the cave. And then they, they, <laughs> yeah, they, they find Professor Jones there and they get some reward, which is uh, an incentive for them because uh, the aliens didn't take all the things they collected with them. They left some things in the cave and those are then gifts for the students so they can get some, some gadgets for the avatars. So um, we did this several times and um, the students always loved it. I did it once with a class of 24 students, 22 were boys and only two were girls. And I've never seen this class so focused, so concentrated, so engaged. They even uh, didn't use the break. They had a double session with me and they didn't use the break, this 10 minutes they would have between the two sessions. They just wanted to solve this mystery. But nevertheless, <laughs> um, some of the students were a bit overwhelmed by handling technology and interferencing at the same time. And some others did not realize that the other avatars were real people and misbehaved a little bit. And the chaos reduction strategy didn't completely work out. But um, what we learned in this first trial was that we need a second quest to do it before in order to introduce students to this kind of activity in a virtual environment. And this is where we developed the second uh, quest, which is the granny quest. And the granny quest is the simplest possible quest that can be done in a virtual or real environment. It's just a scavenger hunt where students are basically sent from one station to the next one where they collect hints and 
well, they are, their interferencing skills are not really challenged, only a very tiny little bit. And the Granny Quest is also a lot easier because there's the same assignment for all students, although they have different starting points. So um, by sending them to different starting points, we make sure that they do not just uh, follow one each other. And the idea of this story is really to make them getting familiar with the environment and this kind of activity. The story is that they have to find out where Granny lived. And organizationally, it's quite similar to the mystery story. It starts with the teacher reading uh, a letter from, from Granny, where it says basically that, uh, well, Granny had died a year ago and she wants, um, she wants to inherit her house to the one who, had, who first finds out where she had lived. And Granny seems to be a little bit a strange personality and um, students have to have again, go, go to Chatterday, meet the team, and then find hints. And those hints are distributed at various locations. Um, if we have actors, then actors would give this information that you see in, in the speech bubble. If we don't have actors here, um, they find the hint as a texture on, on a cube. And each of those hints tells a little bit more about uh, poor Miss Pedigree, about this granny. For example, here at Harold's fashion store, the storekeeper says that uh, each fall she came and bought some of the warmest uh, clothes she had. Her house must have been terribly cold and windy. But maybe uh, you want to go to, to the fish and chips shop. She was a good customer there, so go there and ask. And at the fish and chips, chips shop, they are told that she often brought very fresh fish and asked them to fry it for, them, for her, etc. And finally, they find out that uh, Granny had lived in the lighthouse. And um, there is the lighthouse guardian, which is the only actor we really need for this, for this quest. And the lighthouse guardian then gives them some more background information and hands them over this declaration uh, from the municip municipality of Chatterdale that they are the official owners of the lighthouse now. So these are the two quests that we did with the students. They are fully worked out, um, ready to use in Chatterdale. Just ask Nick <laughs> if you're interested in. Um, our experience is that really students engage very, very nicely with this kind of activity. And especially in a cooperation uh, setting of different schools, it's a brilliant way just to, to get them use the language and, and, and have some fun as well. This brings me to the second aspect of my talk. If you remember my first slide. Um, the second aspect is this data collection aspect. And this is an aspect that uh, we came to via our engagement in the next project. Big Brother is collecting data from you. Um, as I said before, obviously, we have very, very various possibilities to collect data from, from our students. Um, <laughs> he's too drunk. The, the important question, obviously, is which data to collect, what to do with it, and then how to interpret it. And what we did in this trial was that we started with uh, the curriculum aims of our students. Um, of course, you can, well, we use the Common European Framework of Reference for Language Learning. And in, in, this, in this curriculum, you have statements like, for example, students should understand written texts 
in B1 level. So what we can do is we write this fictitious email which they get in B1 level. Then the second question is, of course, what can we observe and how can we can we uh, conclude that the student had understood the text? Well, if the student straightly moves to the right place after having read the text, we well, we think that obviously he has understood it. Of course, we can't be sure, but <laughs> we try to do it. Uh, well, if we do it more often, then hopefully it would statistically be outweighted. And then the third step is how can we observe it? How can we get the evidence? And for this, we used uh, location tracking scripts, an automated greeter script that writes into local chat when an avatar enters a place. So this is really a very simple mechanism to, to track it. It's, it's, it costs a couple of lines of code in, in this object, but it's quite, quite powerful because there's a lot of information that can be derived just by tracking where students move and how they move and how the whole group moves. The second thing we have, of course, are our, our, our actors. So we do not have to generate all this evidence automatically, but we can also ask our non-playing characters to, to assess the, the, the quality of conversation they had with the student. And um, so there's a little pop-up when the student leaves the bar, for example, and the the actor would just press a button and, and assess how well the student spoke to him. And all this evidence then goes into a big log file. And what we do with this log file is we hand it over to a component called Pronifa, which is uh, contributed by Technical University of Graz. And they work with knowledge, with competence-based knowledge space theory approach which is quite theoretically theoretical approach, but the basic idea is to decompose a domain of knowledge into chunks and um, somehow update this competency state. And they have written a very nice little tool, which they call the chat log analyzer module. And in this chat log analyzer module, we can we can uh, quite nicely get some, some deep information about how students behaved and what they did during the session. For example, the first, well, on, on top right, you see the chat intensity over time. So we see how much uh, did the students chat, so how active had they been. Of course, um, analyzing the chat gives a lot of other opportunities as well. For example, we can we can check if they chatted in English, in German, or in Norwegian. We can parse for keywords <clears throat> to find out um, if they behaved well or if they used bad words. Um, then we have what else do we have? Well, there are many more reports, <laughs> but. But this chat intensity is one of the of, of the nicest. The other one, of course, is the the movement pattern, and from this movement pattern, we can derive some information how well the team worked together. Did they stick together or not? Who found a certain hint first? Um, did they just follow each other, or did they use the information they had? And things like this. So we see quite a quite a big potential in this approach, and we would be very happy to get some some support from from the research community to go on a little bit with this with this kind of research. And well, frankly speaking, the hard point, of course, is. Um, to, to derive these rules, to find out some good heuristics to derive information assessment about competences based on this chat log. 
And we were quite surprised how far we got by those simple things that we're tracking right now. So, four minutes left, something. Um, finally, the third aspect of my talk, working with schools. Um, as I said at the very beginning, schools are quite different organizations to work with because they, they're very busy, they follow their own rules, and they have very little time in general. And, but the good news is that there are certain times that work very well. And these are the times we, we have to find out when we approach a school. For example, the last two weeks before the summer break is for many schools a time slot where they are very happy to, to get some new, some interesting, innovative projects in because then the grading <laughs> is already done and Students are, do not know why they really go to school anymore. Um, so to have something really engaging to offer them is, is normally very welcome. Same is true for often for hours in the afternoon when uh, some schools do not have classes, but, some, but students have to be there. So the question obviously is, um, what, what to do with them. Then, of course, the second thing is the curriculum. So we know that uh, what we do has to fix, has to fit into the curriculum, but the curriculums are quite flexible in general. Finally, we know that schools usually have very limited IT resources, but they are quite happy if you help them. And if they see that they're, they have the chance to get somebody in who, who is IT savvy, who can help them with general IT problems, they might embrace you. <laughs> um, yes, of course, schools need to be flexible and often timetables shift and, and things are different in the morning than you thought the, the evening before. This is something we just have to live with. Um, of course, very important, we need a safe environment. So OpenSIM, 3D LES is a lot more uh, useful than, than Second Life. And of course, when we have a cooperation with a school, okay, yes, I'm almost finished. Um, you must be aware that there's huge coordination effort. And one very important thing is to make sure that the students get enough time to build up their relations. So it, the, the virtual environment quest shouldn't be the first time when they meet, but uh, they should have written or exchanged emails before or did some Skype conferencing or whatever. So I think I'm perfect in time, although there's technical hiccups. Um, so, you can, you have to stop the audio, you can continue the text. Okay, so I was just told that they stopped the audio now, but I'm, I'm I answer your questions in text. Let me uh, say one thing here before we quit. I, I thank you, Grahilda, for a terrific presentation. I apologize to you in the audience for the technical difficulties experienced, but I must remind everybody that Open Simulator is still alpha software. This completes the educational portion of the Open Simulator Community Conference 2013. There are still a few social events you may want to attend. You can see the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Thank you again to our speaker and the audience, and then we'll continue uh, on chatting here if you wish. Thank you. Thank you.
can you use voice from that moment? We can use voice. Okay, Beth says we can use voice for another 10 minutes. Um, so Beth, can they hear me now? I do not know here. <laughs> can, can I'm, I'm, I'm going to bet so. So let's just continue until she shuts this off. Yeah, let's just continue until she shuts, shuts this off. Okay. So let's see, there was one one comment. Okay. Um, there was just this one comment from, from, from who was it? The question, are the students in the same classroom in real life where they logged in from their houses? Um, well, in our trials, they had been in the same classroom, which, um, which was one reason. <laughs> well, I, I mentioned this this uh, chaos minimization strategy, and to be honest, I think it helps a lot in minimizing the chaos if they're not in the same classroom. So um, the question is really what kind of organizational con context you have, and I think if it's possible that they do it uh, from their houses in the afternoon, it would work even better. Um, if they are already able to handle the environment, of course. Um, if they have to be in the same classroom, or at least it's cool, it helps to, to, to distribute them at least to different labs, if possible. And of course, if, if it, it starts becoming too loud, then really go, go back to text chat. So um, the way we handled it then was that we restricted voice chat to the conversations with the actors and with and uh, communication within the team was only done via text chat. Um, okay, I think there was one comment about mixing up, yes, problem solving skills and language skills. Yes, this is, this is, of course, a problem. I mean, um, what we derive about language skills has a certain amount of uncertainty in it. And if we do it only once, then maybe it doesn't say anything. If the, at the other hand, if this is an integral, integral part of, of a class and you do it more often, then I think it's, uh, it's possible to derive language skills. And one thing that's important is really to start with the granny quest, <laughs> not to do the, the hardest thing at the beginning, because of course, in the first sessions, they struggle with all kinds of, of things. But once they have the mindset and they are, and they know the way we work and the way these quests work and they know what, it's, what they are expected to do, then I think it works quite well. Any other questions? The kids? The kids can help each other. Of course, I have a class that will go on and every four weeks. Every four weeks for for one class or or one week or Yes, of course, this is, this is a, a question of, of quest design as well. Uh, as soon as you really try to, to assess language skills, then this has to, to deeply uh, go into the quest design. You really have to think what kinds of activities, or what kind of, of tasks they need to perform and what can be derived. Um, no, in, in our example, they, 
they had teams that were mixed with two Austrians and two Norwegians. This was the fun about it. Uh, oh, okay, this is a question to Nick. <laughs> I don't know. It's strange to talk and don't I'm not too hear. I'm not sure. Are you talking about? Okay. Are there any more questions for me? If yes, then please type them now. Grilda, I think that brings us to our second ending of the session, maybe. Uh, okay. Is our, any final question? I apologize for. Um, our timing issues and the technical issues. But thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the audience and thank you, Gerhilda. Well, thank you. <laughs>